This has been a great series, if you've been here, uh, Taking Ground. Love this series. Let me also say that it's a great series if you apply what was taught by Pastor Brandon, Pastor Sean, Pastor John. Because it's not in just the hearing of the word. Uh, it's not just a response that says, oh, that was a great message. You know, I used to bite on that, you know, 40 years ago, 30-some years ago. and That was a great message. My assumption was if it was a great message, you changed. You experienced transformation. Then I learned a great message doesn't mean anything unless there's a follow-up of obedience to what was taught. And that's what James says. I mean, James says, don't be a hearer of the word only. Be a doer of the word. A hearer of the word will be deceived. A doer of the word will be blessed in his deed. When do you take ground? When you're obedient to what's taught. When you're obedient to what the Holy Spirit says. And when you're obedient to what the word of God says. So I think this is a great series. As you think about, you know, we've talked about Ukraine. Tomorrow, Gunnar and I head to Haiti. Uh, we got some great projects going on there. We're building a house. Um, we've got a big school that's being built right now. Uh, we're going to uh, build another house for a single mom. We're going to start five businesses. You're all a part of that, rather. You realize it or not. Um, in Pakistan right now, uh, the team there is on their way up to a place called Kuwaita, Balochistan, Pakistan, which is on the Afghanistan border. Uh, they have a doctor and two nurses, and they are treating 250 families in a Christian slum, and they are treating refugees from Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, I can't remember the other one. Uh, but that's, how, that's going on right now. So uh, let me tell you, whatever you see in the news, you need to always understand that whatever horrors you see going out there, the grace of God is moving faster. It is. And you, and you have to believe that. You have to train your mind for that. You have to discipline yourself. Or you just scroll through the nose and go, wow, this, this world's going to hell in a handbasket. No, it's not. The Spirit of God is taking ground. His kingdom is being advanced right now. Rather, you and I are not, and we're part of it. When you think about the global church, there are 7 million churches around the planet. 4 million of them are stagnant. 2 million of them are dying. 1 million are growing. Now, I can tell you this with certainty. The will of God is not a church that is stagnant and dying. I can tell you this. For the life of a believer, a Christ follower, God's will is not stuck, stagnant, or dying. I can tell you in every area of your life, I don't care what it is, your physical life, your emotional life, your spiritual life, which is all wrapped into one, your marriage, your singleness, your relationships, your career, your calling, your job, where you live, God's will is not stuck, stagnant, or dying. Because he is, present tense, the resurrection and the life. It's not his will. And you, and you have to grasp that. Because you and I will settle for things that are not his will. When we talk about taking ground, we're talking about, today I want to talk about, I was actually, I had a message in Jude. Jude is a one chapter letter right next to Revelation. And man, I was mining these five scriptures and it was alive and it was good. And there was a little whisper of the Holy Spirit. And he said, go back to the past. I'm like, oh, no, this is one of those times where you think you've got it all set. You've got your points. You've got your words. This is good. This makes sense. Go back to the past. Go back to the past. I don't want to go back to the past. Okay, going back to the past. So today I really want to talk about letting go to move forward. You can't move forward unless you let go. If you do mo move forward while hanging on to the past, you'll drag things into the past that will only slow you down and impede your growth. Growth. I, I will tell you that the number one impediment to spiritual growth is people's past. Old thinking, old responses, old relationships, the way things used to be, the way they used to do things, those are impediments. There's a new thing that God is doing. There is a new, you know, when, when the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians, he said, put off the old man which is dead, and put on the new man, which is created in likeness of Christ. And right in between those two transitory points is being renewed in the spirit of your mind. He's talking about your attitude. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about a little bit about the past. I want to talk about taking ground in every area of your life. And, and really, I got like four thoughts and then 50 sub-thoughts that go with this here. So just bear with me. 
the, here's the first thought. To take ground, you got to realize constantly looking back is futile. It's futile. Now, I don't mean just glancing back as a reference point. I mean obsessively looking back at your past is not redemptive. It's not redemptive. It's futile. Think about Jesus. I, I say this is Jesus' shortest sermon. Three words. Remember Lot's wife. <laughs> Jesus is preaching. I got my notepad. Remember Lot's wife. Amen. How powerful is that? What happened to Lot? What happened to Lot's wife? Don't look back. Don't look back. She looked back. Pillar of salt. Gone. Bad. Remember Lot's wife. Quit looking at the past. It's futile. See, in these two years, you hear a lot of rhetoric. Okay, social media, the news, relationships. You hear people talk. These last two years, pandemic. Oh, this pandemic. And then you hear this. I am so done with this. You know that exasperation. I'm, I've heard it. I've heard it so many times. I am so done with this. Little memes. I'm so done with this. Well, if you're done with this, be done with it. Don't be done. I'm so done. You're not done because you keep talking about how so done you are. Get her done. Get get done with this. <laughs> I'm serious. You know. Okay. Don't misinterpret. When I have a little edginess or it seems like a lack of compassion, I have a ton of compassion. But when you hear these contiguous loops, so done. And then they'll say this, I'm so done. I can't wait till it gets back to what it was. Really? You signed up for a life that's lived in the past tense. Seriously. If you're done, be done. Let me tell you this. If you think there's a magical place that was so good before this all started, it's naive at the least, delusional at the worst. It's magical thinking, psychological term, magical thinking. If we could just get back to the way it was, everything will be better. No, it won't. Move forward. Forward. Be done. If you're done, then be done. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 10. <laughs> Love this verse. Say not. I don't, know what, I don't know what translation I got here, but <laughs> say not. <laughs> Why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Let me tell you, the past was not better. The past was familiar. You knew how to do it because it was the past. You know how to do it because you'd done it. In some way, it seems a little more manageable looking back and reaching back for the past. But he says, you don't, wisdom doesn't ask that. The good old days may have been good, but they're old. And the bad old days may have been bad, but they're old if you let them be old. Don't say, why were the former days better than these? It's not from a place of wisdom that you ask this. Israel cries out for over 400 years. Deliver us. Get us out of here. Get us out of the bondage. Get us out of the slavery. Get us out of here. We want freedom. God says, okay, it's go time. So he sends Moses, the deliverer. Exodus, the name means the way out. So God sends Moses. They leave. And it says, and they left with boldness. Isn't that great? They saw signs and wonders. They saw Moses. You saw the movie. He's got the God. Oh, crazy stuff going on, miracles, signs, and wonders. And, you know, and the, and the children of Israel are paralyzed, but then they start getting a little like, wow, yeah, we can do this. Go, Mo, go. 
And so Moses, come on, we're out of here. They take, I mean, all kinds of treasures. I mean, they're just packing it out of there. And they're leaving, and they're thinking it's good, and they're bold, and they're confident the way they should have been, trusting in God and trusting in Moses. But then it says, then Pharaoh pursued them. So Pharaoh kind of went, hey, we lost all of our workers. We lost a whole bunch of stuff. No, 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 no. We're going after them. And they, they go after them. And it says, and when Israel saw them, they were paralyzed with fear. So you go from boldness, we're out of here, to, uh-oh. And they're paralyzed with fear. And they cry out to God, and they cry out to Moses, and then they accuse Moses. Here's a little leadership nosh. I have found that many times when people's lives aren't going well, they attack a leader. No, they do. I didn't know what that was. And then I, I, I realized this, that a lot of times when people's lives are going great, you can do no wrong. And when people's lives aren't going well, they just want to find somebody to blame. You know, blame is still spelled the same way. Be lame. <laughs> it's lame to blame. That's just an afterthought right there. <laughs> then here's what they say. Here's what these confident people said. You brought us out here to die. I am so done with this. <laughs> you brought us out here to die. That's their conclusion. Forget all the miracles now. Forget all the majestic, glorious, miraculous, powerful stuff God and Moses did. Now there's a conclusion. We're going to die. And, and, and you drug us out here because there was no graves. That's just stupid thinking. That's just dumb. But that's the space they're in. And then they say this. It's better to serve the Egyptians. We had fish and garlic and onions. Yeah. They fed you enough to be strong enough to be a slave. But now you're all distorted. When you think about the past too much, it will get distorted. And now they say this. We only have bread. Yeah, bread that's la la flocking down from heaven. I mean, that's not bad bread. Baker God, I think, is probably some pretty good bread. But they're complaining. And here's what I love what Moses, or what God says to Moses. Because Moses jumps in and starts whining to God. And then he says, why are you complaining to me? This is what God says. Why are you complaining to me? Tell the people to move on. D very direct. There's, there's not a lot of commentaries here. There's move on. Move on and move on. Move on in your thinking, move on in your theology, and move on with your feet. Because what you're doing ain't working. That's Hebrew. <laughs> you wanna, here's my message in six words. I'll give it to you. We can go out to lunch, okay? <laughs> Yesterday, I'm at Starbucks in the hood, Citrus Heights. <laughs> okay? <laughs> New Starbucks. Oh, sorry. I, well, after I tell you this, maybe you'll change your opinion. So I go there. I'm waiting for a friend. I get there a couple hours early to study, meditate. And I'm sitting outside, and where I'm sitting, there's a table, and then there's just this little, you know, rail thing. And this car pulls up with two guys. The guy gets out. He goes in to get his drink. And, you know, they probably ordered mobile, whatever. And then this monster truck. You know those really insecure guys that have trucks where the tires are this tall? You know those guys? Yeah. Not saying he was that, but 
So he pulls up. Big truck. <laughs> Giant truck, man. I mean, you need a ladder to get in this truck. And I'm right there. This is this, is this close. This is right here. This is how close the car is. I'm just sitting there. And then all of a sudden, the guy in the monster truck who dropped off, I think, his son to go get the drinks came out. And then the car in front of him that was like right there doesn't move so the guy lays on the horn <laughs> monster horn <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm this is five feet away I'm thinking this is gonna be good <laughs> and so the guy rolls down he's like some 25 26 year old rolls, rolls down his window he yells at the guy shut the blank blank blah 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 yeah and the guy's leaning out he's like boom boom and there's expletives flying man I mean, back and forth. And the guy in the truck is a pretty rough-and-tumble-looking guy. I mean, you know those guys just scratchy, gritty, lined faces, you know. And he was, you could tell this was a tough guy, and there was some tread on his tires. And so these young little clean-cut kids in, in there, man, they start yelling back and forth to the guy. Move! He goes, go around! And it's like, gosh, this is... I didn't even have to pay for the subscription on this one. This is going to be good. So the guy pulls his truck to the side, starts yelling at the guy. The guy starts yelling. He goes right around there. He's one row over. He looks back. You want some? Get out of your car. You come to me. And they are like, seriously, I think it is going to go down in the hood. <laughs> it is going to go down. And I'm just sitting there. And so I just, and so the guy is yelling out of his truck. Oh, 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 oh. And, you know, people are sitting outside and they're going, and I get a, a great idea. Here's my six-word sermon. I yell, move on. It's not worth it. And I'm thinking, that could have been a really dumb thought right there. And the guy looks at me. <laughs> I ain't flinching, man. <laughs> and he drives off. <laughs> then this biker guy comes he gets off his bike he's got the leathers, the chaps big little scruffy guy and the car is still sitting there and so the guy looks at me because I just mouthed off and he goes, what is that? I said, it's a Kia I'm two for two, man. Now I'm shutting up. It's like, I got no time for this. I cannot show up here with a black eye. What happened? Oh, I don't know. Move on. It's not worth it. Your past traumatizing you, terrorizing you, inflicting pain and wounds, dictating your future, your identity, is not worth it. At some point, you got to go, I'm done. Condemnation is not your friend. Looking back and rehearsing all the bad things that happened, all the bad things that were said to you, it's not worth it. It's not fruitful. Oh, no, it is fruitful. It bears bad fruit. And you don't want it. My question is, if it was so good back in Egypt, so good, and they had it so much better there, and it was so much better to serve the Egyptians as slaves, if it was so good, then why are your ancestors crying out for 400 years for deliverance? You forgot that. It wasn't good. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 8. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning. Now, I want to say something might be a little sensitive here. There are a, there's reasons that you have chapters in your life, seasons in your life, and transitions in your life. They are there by design. I mean, the Bible, it, you, know, you cannot read the New Testament without this idea that our faith in our life is progressive. It has to do with advancement. It has to do with future it has to do with moving on, leaving behind, embracing new things that God has for us. You, you, you have to see that. And the end of the thing 
is better than its beginning. When there is a necessary ending, there is always a new beginning. So I don't know what you need to put an end to, but this would be a great time for the Holy Spirit to just drop something in. You know, that, that war story that you keep rehearsing. You know, that, 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 and once again, I don't, I don't want to minimize it. I don't want to say it's so easy. I'm not saying that. I just want, I want you to entertain the idea that at some point, stuck is a choice. At some time, I don't know what time, but at some time, stuck is a choice. Shame has an expiration date. It has to. Grief has an expiration date. At some point, it does. We are called to move on. Paul said in Romans, we move from faith to faith, glory to glory. I guarantee when Jesus said, follow me, he didn't go yoga style. Let's sit down here for a long time. Let's take it all in. Follow me. When somebody says, follow you, it implies they're going somewhere. Jesus wasn't a guru, just called people just to lecture and talk philosophically, the son of God. And he was anointed to do things and bring healing and restoration, fix broken people in their heart, in their mind, in their body. And he invited people to be a part of that. So what else can get in the way? I mean, you, once again, you hear people, and I, I'm, I'm sure I'm guilty of everything that I say here. I remember we got out of Benita. We get here, and you would hear people say, I miss Benita. I, I, I scratch my head. I just miss Benita. Okay, did you miss the mildew? Did you miss that essential oil of mold? Did you miss the sticky seat back? that when you got hot, you would have to pry. <laughs> did, you miss, did you miss the stained carpets? Is that what you missed? No, there's an affection, and I get it. People get met by God in certain places. They have an affinity for those certain places. I tell you what, man, I, that's a reference point. And as far as buildings go, uh, God cares very little about buildings. He does. I'm sorry. Bulldoze them all. You have the church. Church isn't building. Don't, don't get stuck in that rhetoric. Call out the dream thieves in your heart. Listen. When looking back starts looking good, you have dream thieves at work. When I'm talking always looking back, I'm not talking, I look back, I reference. I'll, I'll tell you a little more about that in a few minutes. I'm just saying, if you're stuck cranked this way, no. No. No bueno. There's a dream. There's four of them, actually, that I've seen. Here they are, resentments. It's a dream thief. Bitter indignation at having been treated unfairly. Taken offenses. Bitterness. Indignation. I can tell you this from personal experience. Obsessing about your past will never heal you. Not gonna. How do you know that? Because if it would, I would have stories to tell you about people that their testimony, testimony was, I obsessed over my past and all of a sudden I experienced healing. No. Resentments do damage heart, your mind, your body, and your relationships. Resentment actually means to resentiment, to, to keep going over that loop in your head. Resentments. Regrets. Feeling of sorrow, remorse for a fault, act, loss, disappointment. Listen, just because your life or my life doesn't seem like it was fair at some point, the hand you were dealt doesn't mean your future is going to be unfair. Life may be unfair, but God is good. That, that's true. 
God is good. Read the Psalms. That's the conclusion. Man, life and people serves up a lot of problems and pain and suffering, but God is good. That's what you get out of Psalms. Regrets. Third one, remorse. Painful regret for wrongdoing. How many of you ever done something wrong? How many of you have done wrong things that, man, I, I, I kind of hope mm, like nobody ever knows about that? <laughs> Condemnation is a killer. I describe it as past failure that won't let go. And then this one, controversial. I'm going to give you a controversial one. Three, <laughs> you think woo. Um, rejoicing. Let me qualify it. I'm talking about celebrating old wins and victories without anticipating God doing new ones. Selah. Well, listen, I love my testimony. I love when God did great things. You don't have to go too far without hearing me reference being delivered from an addiction to alcohol. Shared it in every country. Every country I've been, every new church, I've shared it. It is, that testimony is, is so precious to me. But if there's a gap between what happened 39 years ago and now, something's amiss. If Jesus is who he says he is, if the resurrection is true and not a fable, if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in me and will one day ultimately quicken my mortal body, that's game changer. So what I want to suggest is that testimonies can become tombstones unless you keep your anticipator working. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Look, I reflect often. I am a grateful guy. Ask my wife. I am a grateful guy for my life for who God is, what he's done in our life, what he's done in our family. I am a grateful guy. And I'll tell you what, you have two eyes for a reason. One eye to look back at the goodness of God and one eye to look to the future goodness of God that's yet to be revealed. So don't, you know, once again, I'm not am I saying, what, don't celebrate wins? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying make sure you make room to believe God for new things. Those are launching boards. Every good thing, every healing, every answered prayer that I prayed for somebody else, those are springboards to new stuff. How do you know these four are at work in you? Well, it's metal now. <laughs> when you think of somebody that offended you, you have resentment. When you think about them, what's the first thought or feeling you get when the person's name is mentioned? Now, if, that's, if there's that in, internal kind of grip, you know, that kind of, uh, that thing, there's work that needs to be done. I, I had a guy years ago, man, you ask my wife, she'll never tell you his name, but there's one guy, if you just say, who's the one guy in all of Bob's years has flipped his switch? I mean, just and turned him into somebody, somebody different. She said, oh, it'd be, ba 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 I had forgiven this guy a hundred times, my mind. And, you know, and here's the thing. He never did anything about me. He didn't ever say anything about me. He said it about staff members at my church, about other people. And it was like, man, I just, so what did I do? Carried an offense. Man, I just like, sometimes I would just, they, in my mind, I would just <laughs> take him to Citrus Heights and pound him down. <laughs> That's what I would have done in my, in my little head. In my little head, that's what I would have done. I, no, I kid you not. And I, I said, I forgive, I verbalized, God, I forgive this guy, I bless him in the name of Jesus. I did that a thousand times. But yet, when I told a story in a class that I was teaching, and I mentioned it, here's what somebody had the audacity to say. You know, I think you still have some bitterness and unforgiveness. I do not. I said, I think you do. It's like, ooh. It's going to take some humility right now. I said, you're right, but this is 17 years later. I am not that weak. I am not that weak. I was that disobedient. Because as soon as those feelings, that, that, that's a call, man. 
And when you get those feelings towards somebody like that's a call, pray, pray for your heart, pray for them, forgive them. How many times? I don't know. A gazillion. How about regret? Or no, resentments again. How do you feel when you hear that that person that you were resentful for succeeded and got really blessed? <laughs> You're kidding me. Nope, not kidding you. Now, if you go, that's great. God is good. I'm so happy. Perfect. You're going, are you kidding me? <laughs> they do not deserve that. You start doing that kind of stuff, work to be done. Remorse. When you look at your past failures, do you cringe or do you experience grace? When you look at your failures, what do you experience? Shame? Guilt, condemnation, or grace. You know, the Apostle Paul mentioned grace 109 times. The goodness of God, the benevolence of God towards us when we don't deserve it. Grace. Cut yourself some slack. Failure is part of discipleship, by the way. In fact, I wouldn't trust anybody to speak into my life unless they failed a bunch. I wouldn't. That's my makeup. Correct me if I'm wrong. I, I wouldn't. You know, if every time I meet with somebody, well, let me tell you, when I walked on water yet again. <laughs> Can't relate. Sorry. I'm out. Give me some dirt. Give me some struggle. Give me a hardship. Tell me when you were at the end of your rope, losing your mind, and God broke in. Then I'll listen. But it's just everything, oh, praise God. Oh, let me tell you, another miracle. Serious, be careful of those people. No. <laughs> Don't go there. How wide is the gap between what God did and what he's doing? Just think about your life. This isn't like put any, anybody down or anything, but once again, do you believe that Jesus is real time? Yes. Do you believe the Holy Spirit is present tense? Do you believe that this word is active and alive right now? No, not, not, not 2,000 years ago. Not, no, not as literature. Do you believe this word is absolutely alive right now? Okay. So if it's true, then he's making all things new right now. Question is, will you cooperate and not frustrate the grace of God? Big question. How do you move forward? Okay, here we go. Quickly. See, Apostle Paul, once again, Brandon touched on it three weeks ago. More than that, I regard everything as loss. How much is loss? Everything. This is the Apostle Paul. Because, why? Why did he count everything as loss? Because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. When he was talking about knowledge, he wasn't talking about a theological knowledge. He was talking about a real-time experiential knowledge of the presence of God in Jesus. And everything else isn't worth it. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of everything. I regard them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. His spiritual pedigree. He was born into you know, a royal lineage. Hebrew of Hebrews. Theological expert, 100% obedient to the law, persecuted the church, zealous, had the, you say, you know what, that's all loss. I think one translation says dung. It's true. I regard them as rubbish. Not that I've already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus had made me his own. Oh, this is good. Marinate. Brothers, I don't consider myself that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. Now, at this point, Paul could have said, you know, there's about 20 things I want to tell you that I do. He could have given you a list. He says, there's one thing. So if Paul had a life hack meme, this would be it. One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. That's what I've been talking about. Forget what lies behind, straining to what is ahead. I press on to the goal, to the prize, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. Forget what lies behind. Now they say, 
our brain is wired in such a way that everything that has ever gone on, every piece of knowledge, every experience is stored. But the ability to recall it is what changes. When he says forgetting those things which are behind, he is talking about an intentional, deliberate act of not paying attention to those things and paying attention to what future God has for him. And not, he says, not that, not that I already got it, which I think Paul could have said, you know what, I nailed it, but he didn't. And you look at Paul. So what is there for Paul to forget and put in the past? He killed people. He consented to, to Christians getting slaughtered, thinking he was doing God a favor. He had to put that behind him. Think about this. Paul's ministry, his mission. Here's how you could describe Paul's mission. Pray. Preach. Plant a church. Get beat up. Get kicked out of the city. Do it all again. Scars everywhere. Nobody can say, you know, as I reflect on this ministry, it's brutal. But any looking back he did would bring him to a conclusion. Man, I'm a weak dude. In my weakness, his strength is made perfect. Let's all stand up. I want you to think about something here for a minute. My wife and my daughter have been going through how many pictures? Thousands. Pictures. I'm not talking about phone pics. I'm talking like, how many of you know what a real picture is? <laughs> okay. Like pictures. Boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of pictures. So I looked at them and I started spreading them out. A couple collages. Does that work? Oh, there we go. So I just, I just like, I just spread a bunch of pictures out. And there, there was one of these pictures, and I looked, and I, th I thought, man, I was a good dad. No, I think I was a great dad. And then I saw another picture. And I remember how angry I was on the day that picture was taken. I went, you've got to be kidding me. Upper left is when I was wanted FBI. That's the past, so. <laughs> Medicare right there. I looked at it, it's like, wow, this is great. You've got the seeds of mission. It's like 27 years old, the seeds of mission. You've got car wrecks. You've got great food. You've got a great church family. You've got great friends. You've got poverty. You've got a son that God has redeemed and restored. <laughs> Sitting right there. Love that guy. Leading in prayer when I was in Haiti. Give me the next one. Got my brother. You got disaster. You got blessings. I want you to think about your life, you know. These pictures, I thought, these life, th these pictures, like really show what a full life looks like. In, in these pictures, there is death, destruction, blessing, generosity, hardship, short, lack, miracles, healings, prayers that got answered, prayers that don't know what happened there. You got, oh, man, you got grandsons awesome and, I, and I, here's my thought when you go through the whole list of what your life is like nobody's life is different it's only the degrees that are different so I would challenge you that if you just take 40 pictures if you know how to do that <laughs> you know how to get a picture and spread them all out and look at your life and, and, and just see if it's not true but there's ups, downs, highs, lows, blessings, curses, good things, bad things, useful things, all kinds of great things, bad things. And that's our life. That's, that's the life, the lot. And some of the, some of the pain was self-induced, self-inflicted. God's grace is there. It's good. See, here's the deal. Your story is still being written. Like right now, it's being written. Here's my question. Are you going to trust your perspective and what happened in your past or will you trust who Jesus says he is in your life? So here's what I want. I'd like prayer people to get up here. And, uh, and I, this is what I, I, I really felt like for this. That 
There's some of you that your past just dogs you and torments you. And I just want to tell you, at some point, it doesn't have to. Once again, I can't tell you the time frame. I, I wish I could tell, but I do tell you this, that if you're intentional and you say, you know what, that thing is just still dogging me. Like that guy, that, that one thing, that one guy dogged me for years, and I thought I, I had already forgiven him. But I hadn't because my heart hadn't caught up to the obedience of my, my prayers. And so here's what I would do. As we go, I'm going to pray for you, and as you go, if there's just that thing, you don't have to get specific. You can if you want. And it may be something that happened to you. It may be something that you did to somebody else. Or maybe it's, you know, disappointment with God. Those are big, man. There's a lot of people that get stuck and go through religious motions because in their mind, God let them down. But I, I will tell you that accusing God is absolutely futile. He's big enough to handle it. He is, but it's futile. It, it does not work. It will not serve you well. So maybe you're at the first stage of, man, I realize I have somebody i got to forgive. You just come up and just say, hey, there's somebody I need to forgive, and I don't really know how to do it. I don't know how to let it go. And let brothers and sisters, mature people, stand in the gap for you and help you. Because you this life we can't do on our own. I'll just tell you that right now. You can't do it on your own. No. I needed somebody to call me out. Somebody that was humble and bold to call me out and say, you still got some stuff there. I had to humble myself and say, mm, uh, hate to admit it, but you're right. So we prayed, and I can tell you, it's good. My heart's clean, totally clean. Actually pray for the guy to be blessed, and I hope he is. No joke. <laughs> Even finally accepted his friend request after about eight years. Uh, anyways, <laughs> Father, I pray right now. And if, and if you just need some work, attention to your past, just come on down, grab one of these people. Father, I thank you. The past is the past. But we know that sometimes the wounds still linger. So I pray for people, God. I pray that you would just show and reveal, like an x-ray or a CAT scan, situation, area of their past that has been tormenting them, won't let them go. The person, the offender, the abuser, disappointment with you maybe I pray that you give people courage just come up just link arms with somebody I pray for a release God I pray for a divine disempowerment of the tyranny of people's pasts and I pray today would give people a fresh infusion of vision and hope and redemption and resurrection life I pray today would be a defining moment for people we thank you. We thank you, God. The one guy in another country had an alcoholic looked at me. I'm preaching the love of God, the grace of God. He said, I have done many bad things. I am a bad man. I said, this is eyeball to eyeball, nose to nose. I said, your badness is no match for the mercy, the love, the grace, the redemption, and the forgiveness that's in Jesus Christ. That's the truth. And then I said, now you're going to get on your knees with me. And you're going to invite Jesus to be Lord of your life. And he did. Bless you guys. <laughs>